This may sound strange coming from someone who ostensibly spends a huge chunk of her life reviewing things, but I've kind of given up on being quote unquote objective with my opinions on games and other things. There are certain things that just are objective. If something literally doesn't function or has an error of some kind, that's just a fact. So glad I'm playing this instead of Cyberpunk 2077. But there's a certain trend in reviews where the reviewer will attempt to set aside their personal biases to present objective observations or conclusions, and I sort of just think that's a pointless and somewhat impossible endeavor. How someone feels or thinks about some fictional something or other and why they feel or think that way is inherently subjective, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If I say that I think a game is perfect or nearly perfect, then I'm saying that in regards to what I think and feel about that game and other games in relation to it. That doesn't establish anything about it in an objective sense, and I'm absolutely going to try to explain why I think and feel that way, so hopefully someone else can understand where I'm coming from, even if they don't necessarily agree. It's part of why I started changing my video titles from why you should play, slash watch, slash whatever, to Callus Recommends. There is no objectively correct choice for best game of all time or best game in a genre. That's just not how it works. There's popular opinion, sure, but there's no guarantee that any individual's opinion will line up with whatever most people think. I certainly find myself deviating from popular opinions about big games fairly often, or just find myself enjoying relatively niche forms of entertainment, like the Yu-Gi-Oh anime or tokusatsu. I'm going on a tangent and could probably literally talk about this subject for hours. The point is that I thought the second Layton game, Diabolical Box, was nearly perfect, and any follow-up to that is going to need to do a lot of things that I really, really like for me to walk away not disappointed. That said, I'm Callus, and I recommend Professor Layton and the Unwound Future, or the Lost Future, depending on your region. Allow me to present my solution. It seems I was right on the money. So let me first say that I don't think Unwound Future is as good of an individual game as Diabolical Box. But the third Layton entry is a super enjoyable adventure that serves as an excellent ending to the initial Layton trilogy. After how much I loved the second game, I had incredibly high expectations, and it met most of them, but it also did some interesting and unique things that sets it apart from the previous two games. I did have a few complaints, but when I had finished my time with the game, I definitely felt rewarded, not only for playing this game, but for playing and caring about this whole initial trilogy. Which is a very lovely and unfortunately uncommon feeling. Broadly speaking, if you enjoyed the first two games, you will likely enjoy this third game. Despite some noteworthy differences, the overall experience is very similar. A bit of housekeeping before the steel ball gets properly running, all the familiar notes if you've seen my first two latent videos. There's one a pull on my Patreon, you wouldn't be seeing this at this particular point in time if not for my patrons, so thank you to everyone who voted in that poll, and to all of my supporters of course. And I played the mobile HD version through the Bluestacks emulator because that was convenient and made accessing the weekly puzzles simple rather than borderline Herculean. Also, there are going to be a handful of light spoilers in here for Layton 1 and 2, just by the nature of this being a sequel. The hook to the plot this time around relies on how fond you are of the Layton characters. This is going to be a recurring theme to this video, but this probably shouldn't be your first Layton game. Preferably start with one, because it's the first one. Two is an okay starting place and absolutely excellent, whereas three regularly relies on you knowing and caring about established characters. Case in point, the story kicks off with Layton and Luke riding a bus towards a clock shop. They're talking about a letter that Layton has received from someone claiming to be Luke from 10 years in the future. Apparently, London has fallen, or will fall, into chaos, and he needs the Layton of the present to help. 
Obviously, if you don't know or care about Leighton or Luke, this likely won't cause more than a curious eyebrow raise in you. I, however, absolutely love this puzzle-obsessed gentleman and his determined apprentice, and I was immediately a thousand percent in. My mind was racing with questions and possibilities. If this really is the Luke of the future, then why can't the Leighton of the future provide assistance? Is he dead or missing? Is this threat so great that a single Leighton isn't enough to outwit it? And if this future Luke is lying, to what end? What could possibly motivate telling such an elaborate lie? I was also, of course, excited to see what the near future of the Leighton world looked like in terms of technology and aged up character. Leighton and Luke continue their conversation and ruminate upon the events of about a week ago, where a time machine demonstration went awry. I hope that you're beginning to see that the name of this game doesn't appear to be a particularly subtle one, though to be fair, the titular Curious Village and Diabolical Box made appearances rather early on in their respective entries as well. So. In that flashback, Leighton and Luke, as well as Chelmy and Barton, have been invited to a demonstration of a time machine. One Dr. Stongun, I hate his name, convinces Prime Minister Bill Hawks to volunteer to test it. It goes catastrophically poorly. Multiple people, including Stongun and the Prime Minister, are missing and presumably dead. There are no obvious connections to the letter Leighton has received, aside from the coincidental timing, related subject matter, and the fact that the narrative is telling us to pay attention to this as a thing that happened. After we flash forward, Leighton and Luke depart from the bus in, I'm sure, an incredibly gentlemanly fashion, and after some tutorial adventures that contain pretty much everything you would expect them to, and an actually kind of adorable but also kind of heartbreaking encounter with Stash and Scarfin, the lads enter the clock shop that features a gigantic room-sized clock that, after some puzzle-based repairs, apparently functions as a time machine. After tumbling through time, they are very shortly and somewhat rudely spat out onto the streets of future London. Here, they are led on a somewhat elaborate trail by future Luke that's meant to convince Leighton that this is indeed the future. On the one hand, this is an incredibly wild claim, so fair. On the other hand, spending so long establishing this as an element is funny in a game called Unwound Future. At any rate, once this is established, future Luke actually regularly adventures with present Luke and Leighton, which I found to be a really cute and fun change up to the formula. Not too long into investigating future London, we are told that Unwound Future's villain is actually the Professor Leighton of the future. The temptation of time travel turned him evil because of spoiler reasons, and he now controls London through a crime syndicate. Future Luke requested the assistance of our time's Leighton, because who could best Leighton but Leighton himself? Yeah, that checks out. I absolutely adore this idea. Unwound Future immediately and wholeheartedly embraces the fantastical side of the Leighton world. Curious Village buried it until near the end. Diabolical Box introduced it early, but had a gradual buildup towards it coming entirely to the forefront. But Unwound Future dives into the deep end without hesitation, and I fucking love that. And it also continues the trend of escalation on crazy stuff, which I obviously can't show at all, but rest assured that the final few hours of the game are gloriously ridiculous while still managing to feel very meaningful, heartfelt, and moving. In many ways, the initial presentation of the plot seems to ask fewer questions than the previous Leighton games, or rather, the questions are asked and very quickly answered, but rest assured that there are still plenty of mysteries and twists and turns along the way. The story still feels very Leighton. As I mentioned before, the early story absolutely gripped me in large part because I already cared about Leighton and Luke. This is a much more personal story than we saw in the first two games, but I'm very much here for it. The first two games feel like the Leighton cast are interacting with a story about other people, but the focus of Unwound Future is more on the main Leighton cast, especially Leighton himself. The interactions between Luke, Leighton, and future Luke are an absolute delight light to behold. I genuinely could not get enough. I was already in love with the dialogue in these games, but I was so fascinated by Luke's all grown up version and the plot implications related to him that it started bordering on obsession a bit. 
I love time skips in media, and this appealed to me for many of the same reasons. Getting to see what a character looks and acts like after the addition of time to the impact of whatever happened earlier in the narrative is super, super fun to me. It's just young Luke is also there marveling and or being upset at his older self. It's super cute. I also can't help but think that Luke's barely contained feral rage is still brimming under the surface somewhere for future Luke. <laughs> I love future Luke. Yeah, no. He's, he's great. Super great. He's great. At any rate, it becomes even more delightful when Flora joins in on the adventure. This time around, she's more outspoken, adventurous, and she's following Leighton's teachings in her own way. It seems like she's more willing to go against Leighton's wishes than Luke is, but not in a directly antagonistic way. She just wants to be where the action is. I love her so very much, and I'm so glad that she gets treated as well as she should be this time around. She even has puzzle-solving animations! Hmm, does this sound right? Take that, puzzle! This is literally exactly what I asked for. I love these so much. If you've actually been watching the video rather than just listening to it while you do something else, you'll have noticed that Future Luke also has puzzle submission animations. Future Luke and Flora also don't seem to just randomly get left out of conversations that they should probably be commenting on, so that's appreciated as well, and is one of the few clear improvements over Diabolical Box. Also, they both have little sprites along with Leighton and Luke's, and I always appreciate some quality pixel art. Over the course of the game, you'll run into plenty of familiar faces. I already mentioned Chelmy and Barton, and they do get to play a somewhat meaningful role again, which I enjoyed for the same reasons I enjoyed their role in too. Having more traditional investigative assistance helps to highlight how incredibly intelligent Layton is. Also, they're just fun characters who I like to get to see again. For better or worse, there is a shift in the writing philosophy. Instead of all the minor characters and locations deeply tying into the larger mystery, the important events all wind up with a deep personal connection to the core Leighton cast. It does still feel like everything's connected, nothing you're doing is a waste of time, the focus is just different. I'm going to reiterate this in case it didn't stick in the first time. This really shouldn't be your first Layton game. It's akin to starting Star Wars with Episode 6. You'll probably understand that the Death Star is bad and that Luke is good, but you won't necessarily care about his climactic encounter with Vader and the Emperor. This comparison is far more fitting than I initially realized because the second Layton trilogy is also a prequel. I'm gonna take a stab in the dark here and guess that the Leighton prequels are probably better than the Star Wars prequels. Not that that's a particularly noteworthy accomplishment, they just have to be halfway competent and not painfully boring. Leighton himself especially comes into focus throughout this adventure. We get to learn a lot about his backstory and day-to-day -day life. A lot of whys that I never even thought to ask about him or answered. And we get to see like his classroom and get a taste of his day job, which I very much appreciate. I I can't get enough of stuff like this for characters that I care about. I would, no joke, read a book that's just about Leighton going about day-to-day -day activities that have nothing to do with adventure. Leighton goes to the store. A hundred percent. Um. Hmm, the price of milk has gone up by five cents. <laughs> ah, I understand exactly why. <laughs> Luke, would you like me to phrase it in the form of a puzzle? Our core Leighton cast gets a lot of complexity and depth added to them, which based on the first two games, I did not expect in the slightest. And yet, I was over here crying my eyes out over these characters multiple times. Even Leighton's journal entries have a bit of this added complexity to them. It is absolutely delicious. Thank you, this will keep me fed for months, if not years. The tone of the story is familiar late and fair. Moment to moment, things are usually laid back and relaxing, cute, quirky, and fun, but when the story really comes into focus, there's danger and more than a few emotional gut punches. Like I said, I cried a lot because I care a lot, but overall, it sends a heartfelt, happy, and hopeful message. Stories that spread positivity are nice, actually. Don't get me wrong, I love dark stuff too, but being able to just relax and feel wholesome emotions, but also turn into a sobbing mess from time to time, is nice. 
There is a drawback to this change in focus. I very much believe that the trade is worth it, but all of those individual minor characters not all tying into the main mystery and narrative as cleanly as in the first two games is a noticeable change. While they all do still matter in some capacity, I could argue that the first two games were just as much about the various minor characters as the main mystery, or at least that pretty much every single minor NPC was important to that main mystery, which simply isn't the case in this entry. That said, I was still constantly having fun meeting the widely varied, colorful, cute cast of characters that the game threw my way as I explored the streets of both future and present London. And the game does do something with your investment in most of those characters, it's just not as plot important or emotionally compelling as how the first two games handled that aspect. My favorite minor characters were Becky, with how she'd go from proper and formal when her grandmother could hear, to more direct and abrupt when she couldn't. As a trans girl, that is a sadly relatable feeling, having to put on a performance at work or with family, either because of being partially in the closet or simply fearing that their acceptance of me hinged on their perception of how I carry myself. Am I projecting a bit for the sake of a bit? Yes. But also, I'm adopting Becky as my trans daughter and no one can stop me. Then there's Hazel, who's constantly trying to run and hide from Leighton because he thinks Leighton is the leader of a criminal organization because, you know, the plot, which is expressed by him hiding behind the edges of the screen and peeking his head on screen like a little bit. It's a clever little fourth wall tap that takes advantage of the medium. I appreciate it. Also, the concept of someone trying to impersonate Leighton to gain clout, but very obviously not looking anything like Leighton is so good. So Layman gets an honorable mention as well. This time around, the main story was more of what was pulling me forward rather than the moment to moment exploration. Not because I loved the exploration less, but that I loved Rome at the narrative more. As I expect from Leighton at this point, the setting was once again an interesting and engaging one that ties very cleanly into the narrative and its various mysteries. The game being set in future fucking London is important. Who would have thought? These topics all have enough to do with spoilers that I'm not really able to delve into too much detail. Good writing was good and I enjoyed it. Mostly. There are a few caveats. There are two very personal problems I have with the narrative, both entirely a matter of taste and preference. I'm just putting my opinions out there. It's my video. I want to provide my perspective. Which reminder is the perspective of your friendly, likely not so local trans lesbian who is an individual and doesn't speak for the community as a whole. I may be tipping my hand for one of the problems I had, but whatever. I'll dance around spoilers, of course, so don't worry about that. Firstly, there is a lot of importance placed on a heterosexual romance and a lot of male characters wind up with their motivations being tied very much into their feelings for one specific woman. Look, it's just, I'm gay and tired. It's handled well enough and in a very wholesome and incredibly latent way. I liked it as much as I could. There are things tied into this that made me both laugh and cry harder than I had at anything else in this series thus far. It's just, I haven't really talked about this in depth in recent memory, but it's genuinely reached the point that straight romances are something I just kind of tolerate in fiction. I can and still do get emotionally attached to some of these, think they're sweet or cute when done well, which is the case here. I did care about the cishet romance in this story, and the ones in Xenoblade Chronicles, The Adventure Zone, and some stuff in Gundam, but whenever any quality of romantic stuff between two canonically cishet characters becomes the primary focus in any fictional medium, a piece of me gets pulled out of the narrative and is dedicated to a commentary in the back of my head about how few depictions of LGBT plus experiences, romantic or otherwise, there are in mainstream fiction, and how most of those are in some capacity depicted in a censored, exploitative, or overly tragic way. This can lead me into a mildly depressive spiral where I think about all the bullshit real world stuff that the community still faces, which kind of slaps the escapism airship out of the sky for a bit. And when I now 
naturally wind up comparing this complicated feeling to the euphoria I feel when given even the barest scraps of canon gay content in something I care about, like Korra or Ruby, I can't help but think about how much more I would like what I was seeing on the screen or reading on the page or playing in the game or whatever if it was in some way queer. To be clear, I'm not saying that heterosexual romance shouldn't be in fiction. I'm sure that a lot of people enjoy this stuff, and if you are one of those people, I am genuinely glad that you have an excellent, healthy depiction of that romance here. I'm just saying that I can't entirely enjoy it because of problems that are not at all the fault of this individual piece of fiction, but of fiction as a whole, and also that I desperately wish that the world was a better place, and that homophobes and transphobes and racists and sexists for that matter should fuck entirely off all the time forever. As a side note, this doesn't apply at all to real world heterosexual relationships. I want everyone to be happy and have healthy romantic relationships, same sex or otherwise. Polyamorous or monogamous, whatever form those relationships take is entirely fine with me, as long as it makes all of the people involved in those relationships happy. And if you don't want a romantic relationship at all, I wish you the very best as well. I can't believe that this is a controversial statement to some people, but as long as you aren't hurting anyone, do what makes you happy. Sorry not sorry for the tangent, I promise I won't go this in depth every single time I'm talking about a thing that has cishet romance in it. I just felt like getting into it here because I haven't before and this was a perfect example of a well-written cisgender heterosexual romance subplot that left me feeling this way. So in the future, if you can hear the eye roll in my voice as I breeze past the fact that there's a cishet romance in something, you can refer back to this for the more nuanced explanation of why I respond that way. The second personal issue is much more rooted in this specific game as opposed to a meta complaint about fiction as a whole, I promise. Like pretty much any mystery narrative, there are a lot of plot twists. Obviously I can't go in depth on this without spoiling a bunch of things, but there are a couple of twists that take the plot in a direction I'm less fond of than what otherwise could have happened. I know that's incredibly vague. If you've played the game, I hope you can accurately guess at what exactly I'm talking about, but if not, I don't want to spoil something like that in this video. I still like all of what happens, I'm just sad about the potential of certain things that could have been. All of the ideas that are explored are interesting in concept and excellently executed on, but I can't help but be sad about not getting to experience what this game could have been had some particular plot point zigged instead of zagging. Most of the improvements made in Diabolical Box are still present here. The cutscenes are still made more dynamic by the addition of more unique art and framing, voice acting is fairly common and adds to the emotional impact of pivotal scenes, and the pacing of the story is impeccable from beginning to end. Puzzles tend to be integrated in ways that make sense and motivate me to engage with them. In order to avoid too much repetition in terms of backtracking, shortcuts and fast travel points open up around future London as you progress. It's slightly more repetitive than the second game in this respect, but it's nowhere near as much of a repetitive setting as that curious little village from Leighton and Luke's first adventure. And it was almost never a noticeable problem for me. The music is classy and compelling compelling with classical instruments played in a variety of styles that fit all the puzzle solving, wandering, and danger. I don't like the clock themed puzzle track as much as the diabolical box puzzle track, but it's still pretty dang good. The animation from PA Works is consistently great, though there is a bit more meh 3D stuff this time around. The animation still adds to the more exciting action-y moments that I can't at all show you, but it's great for when things get 17 kinds of crazy near the end. Because the story is a bit more to the point this time until it starts delving into heavy spoiler territory, we get to talk about the puzzles just a bit earlier. Look, it's game three. You probably know the deal by now. I'll try to go fast ish through the stuff you likely already know, but also I really like to say a lot of words sometimes. Sorry, not sorry. 
Puzzles bring you to a separate screen, usually with some amazingly adorable art, this time with a few new faces added into the Puzzle Troop cast. I love the idea of a recurring cast of characters for the puzzle art, so I'm very happy that that's seemingly a staple now. Also, Unwound Future seemed far more willing to have main characters appear in puzzle art, which is just delightful every single time. And the puzzles, of course, always have some way for you to provide some kind of answer, be it typing something out, selecting from a list of options, or using that touch screen, or in my case, mouse, to interact with something in an interesting way. There are more unique puzzle answer input mechanics, like shifting around the ingredients of a sandwich, or placing and turning mirrors to change the direction of beams of light. Most of them are really fun and cute to interact with, and I appreciate the added variety. It really feels like more of them are taking clear advantage of the fact that this is a video game that you can actually interact with in more ways than just drawing. It's fun and it makes me excited to see what later games do in this respect. You, again, have pretty much every tool you can want to help solve the puzzles. Still no calculator, though. And because I am still stubborn and a fool and a stubborn fool, I pretty much only use the drawing and erasing tools. I still saved compulsively for fear of submitting an incorrect answer and not receiving the absolute maximum number of pickerats, those being the points you are rewarded for solving puzzles that unlock a variety of bonuses. But the amount that you get from a given puzzle goes down if you submit an incorrect answer hence the saving, even though there are far more than you actually need to unlock everything. They still take away more than they add from my experience, but it's not really that big of a deal for me to save super often, and I typically find myself doing that in pretty much every game that I can, so I'm still just kind of eh on Pickerats overall. The judgment screen after you submit a puzzle is still anxiety inducing, but like in a fun way, the lines and animations are still all absolutely wonderful. I've got a good feeling about this one. Well, that's settled. There's a very, very, very wide variety of puzzles, even more so than before, which is a rather impressive accomplishment, both in terms of number of puzzles and their content. Compared to Diabolical Box, there are more frequent mediocre puzzles, not ones that drag the whole experience down, but just ones that are rather simple and straightforward that took me almost no time to find the solution to. And there are a few that I found to be just out and out bad, namely, where's the arrow, a question of taste, the messy note, and x-ray vision. Solving these didn't feel at all intuitive, and even once I found the answer to these, it didn't feel satisfying. It just kind of seemed like the game was trying to trick me rather than make me feel clever for finding an answer. I'm sure that's a your mileage may vary kind of thing. Point is, I didn't have fun with them. And the difficulty curve isn't as consistent as in Diabolical Box. I felt blindsided by more puzzles this time around, and there would occasionally be a puzzle that was laughably simple compared to everything else I was dealing with at that point in the game. I guess you could argue that this could be because it's not meant as an entry game to the franchise, but I still prefer the difficulty curve of the game that may or may not contain a vampire. I have not kept it a secret in these videos that I don't frequently reach for puzzle games for entertainment purposes, but three games into Layton, I've actually noticed that I bounce back faster from incredibly difficult puzzles or those that I found to be poorly designed. Obviously, I'd prefer to not feel dumb when playing a game, but generally, even if there is a puzzle that left a poor taste in my mouth, I now recover from that relatively quickly, whereas during my playthrough of Curious Village, I frequently found myself needing needing to take breaks to cool off or to get into a better headspace. Gaining genre experience feels good, actually. It makes me genuinely happy that I stepped out of my comfort zone. That said, my usual weaknesses do return. Theoretical spatial reasoning, especially in three dimensions, feels like fucking poison to me. However, I have been being exposed to that poison repeatedly over the course of these three games, and I think I've built up a bit of a tolerance. I don't necessarily like drinking poison in the form of playing through a weird dice puzzle, but I don't feel like it's killing me anymore. It just leaves a funny taste in my mouth and gives me a bit of a headache. Still bad, not nearly as bad as death. Slide puzzles still murder me instantly. Lily still insists on trying most of them, even though she also hates them. Why do you do that? Because sometimes I can, and that tiny bit of serotonin staves off the horrors of depression for just a 
minutes. But what about when you can't, and then it feels bad? Oh no. <laughs> but of course, we have an antidote to any poison that the Layton series could provide in the form of Catriel's wonderful guide that is linked below, which I still highly recommend for a spoiler-free way of circumventing whatever problems you may have with individual puzzles. Even though I didn't love every single individual puzzle, I did enjoy the vast, vast majority of them. Considering the fact that there are just more puzzles this time around, I'm not particularly upset about a few less than great ones slipping through because there's even more genuinely fun ones added in. Between the context for the puzzles, the art, and my growing familiarity with Layton, I do generally just look forward to solving the puzzles now. Apparently, just playing through three video games can completely change my opinions about something. It's still far from my favorite genre, but I'm definitely not afraid to take a glance at other puzzly stuff going forward. I guess Layton's wholesome love of puzzles is a bit infectious. That's the power of positivity and a well-crafted gameplay experience wrapped in a very wholesome, pleasing, and well-written package. My favorite puzzles were the gravity maze puzzles where you turn a maze so little gel block things fall into their correct places. The fact that I can actually interact with the puzzle and see something happening is what makes me have more fun with the spatial reasoning aspect. That's why I always say that theoretical spatial reasoning puzzles are something I'm terrible at. I just have a lot of trouble reasoning out things like this in my head. But with a simple interactive interface and visuals to go along with it, it's suddenly my favorite puzzle type in the game. I know that could technically also describe slide puzzles, but that's different because of how many steps I have to take in my brain to not fuck it up. And I just always, always, always fuck it up. Sometimes my brain confuses even myself. I was gonna make a self-bashing joke here, but you know what? Fuck that. I like who I am. Strange intricacies and all. The other core aspect of the gameplay loop also remains largely the same. You click the boot in the corner to travel from screen to screen, each with detailed and beautiful background art, and as you explore, you can talk to a massive cast of delightfully designed and wonderfully written characters, many of whom will give you puzzles to solve. For someone who absolutely talks to every single possible NPC in every single JRPG she plays, this was a relaxing experience. Every conversation felt worthwhile, and the walking around gives a nice change of pace from locking in and thinking about puzzles. That's how Layton's flow has been from the start. It was fun then, and it's fun now. No need to reinvent the wheel. I could, however, go for a rework of Hint Coins. Actually, they're fine, I just don't really gain much from interacting with them. I just thought that would be a good transition to this next subject, which I have now ruined by delving into this. Shit. Hmm. Huh. They're the same as the previous two games. Intended gameplay experience is to click around randomly on the backgrounds for a few of them, then spend them to get hints on puzzles that you're having trouble solving. My completionist compulsions had me wanting to collect and save all of them because a cute little icon on the pause screen changes based on how many you have. Clicking around to find hint coins isn't fun for me because it just felt like repetitive busy work and I didn't get to engage with the hint system at all because I wanted to save all of them. Once again, that impeccable guide from Catriel allowed me to find all the hint coins without wasting my time and to get hints on any puzzles I was having trouble with without spending any of the coins. You get less overall assistance from the side objectives on finding hint coins. There's an animal companion who will occasionally point to one again, and there are a few that have a larger hitbox around them that sort of functions as a hint for where the coins are, sometimes with a cute putt-putt-esque visual for when you collect the coin. Those two things can definitely help anyone who just wants to find a few to spend on puzzles, but they weren't enough to stop me from using a guide to collect them all. Also, hidden puzzles return and are pretty much identical to how they were in the first game. No cute little mini game to help find them. They're just in random places. Thank you again to Catriel for creating that guide so I didn't have to pull my hair out searching every pixel of every background. 
Granny Riddleton has a bit of a change going on this time. Mechanically, things are the same. You can go to certain areas, talk to an NPC, and then access any puzzle that is no longer available due to your progression in the story, which is an appreciated feature that I never found an actual use for because it doesn't replicate the pre and post puzzle dialogue. If you don't care about seeing all of that dialogue, which you should, it's well written, damn it, then this can ensure that you can always return to a puzzle that you found particularly difficult just happen to never come across or that you have options for solving puzzles when the main story demands that you actually solve a certain number of puzzles before progressing how very cruel of the puzzle game Early in the game, presumably because of the time travel, Granny R retires and is replaced by a talking bee named Beasley, whom I fucking love. And there's a bit of narrative that happens with the Puzzle Shack stuff throughout the game, which actually gave me a reason to engage with and care about the related characters beyond a tutorial explanation. I'm pretty much always going to appreciate more latent dialogue, whatever form it comes in. Also, Puzzlet is a fucking monster. <laughs> she knows what she did everyone knows what she did her sins are crawling on her back <laughs> the side objective mini game things are once again a similar concept but very very different in their specifics they're little side activities that you work on as you progress through the game generally you access them from the pause menu after getting a new item or request from an npc and completing them unlocks some of the ultra hard challenge puzzles from the bonus section the animal companion this time around is a parrot i named him phoenix which i wish was canon so there could be a joke about it in the ace attorney crossover game not that later games ever actually acknowledge the existence of the previous animal companions i would really appreciate knowing that friender is doing all right at any rate, the mini game associated with our feathered friend is a series of delivery puzzles. Basically, you draw lines between posts, which creates platforms for the determined delivery bird to jump or bounce off of. He carries whatever he's delivering on his head. The sprite work is super, super cute. I love this bird. The puzzles themselves are pretty much just informed trial and error. The physics on it are a bit crazy at times, but I did have fun. My only complaint is that I wish the lost screen went by faster so I didn't have to be on top of hitting the reset button to save time before it entered a fail state, but that's a very nitpicky complaint. It's cute, I had fun, and it actually gives more dialogue and narrative tidbits, which I always, always appreciate from Layton. And the animal companion is actually involved in the main story this time instead of being optional, so I really like this one. Next up is the toy car that Luke gets, or toy cars, maybe? Basically, it's framed as Luke playing with toy cars, which is absolutely adorable. Getting new cars or tracks from NPCs unlocks new puzzles. The gameplay on these is sort of reminiscent of the hamster mini game from Diabolical Box. Basically, each toy car puzzle is a grid. The car has a specific starting position and you can choose its orientation a thing a lot of games sadly still don't let you do. You're given a set amount of tiles for each puzzle that have a variety of effects on the car, like causing it to change direction or causing the car to jump. When you hit start, the car will begin to drive, then interact with all the tiles you placed, as well as whatever happens to be on the map. Your goal is to set up a route for the car that will allow it to pick up all of the collectibles in the puzzle and then reach an exit tile. These might actually be my favorite puzzles in the game and are definitely my favorite side activity. The visuals and concept are as cute as can be and I found the puzzles to be engaging to the point that no matter how long I spent on one, I never felt it was overstaying its welcome. I genuinely wish I had more to say about it, but I simply love it. The final side objective mini game thing is about picture books. You fill in the blanks and stories with stickers that you collect from NPCs. The stories are like cow jumped over the moon simplistic, but the art style might be one of the cutest things I've ever seen. Getting to see latent characters in that art style is an absolute treat and logicing out where each sticker should go based on the hints and context clues provided was a fun experience. There are three books total 
total and you can only use each sticker in their specific book, so it's not a particularly overwhelming amount of choice on each book. Very straightforward, but I liked it. So yeah, I found all of the mini games this time around to be an improvement. All of them had a puzzle aspect that I enjoyed, they're integrated into the latent world in overwhelmingly cute and utterly charming ways. They were a fun distraction and change of pace from the main game, and I am now eagerly looking forward to what future games will contain in this respect, whereas before they were mostly just a side note for me. My only complaint is that there were no robot dogs. I can't help but feel that that's a step back. The bonus stuff is slightly improved this time around, but it's mostly exactly what you'd expect. Cutscene, music, and voice clip players are there if those are your kind of thing. I don't usually get much mileage from them, but I'm not going to complain about their presence. The one thing like that that I am really fond of is the profile viewer because there's new writing and information there, including profiles for the puzzle art troupe, so that's lovely, but pretty much the same deal as last time. Shoutouts to Puzzle Gal five for collecting teacups despite hating tea. I have absolutely no idea how you could have possibly fallen into this particular hobby, but I support you wholeheartedly. The puzzles in the bonus section are where we see some improvement. The challenge puzzles are pretty much the same. Super fucked hard puzzles, probably about half of which were out of my depth, or just slide puzzles, which are my bane, but the other half of which I did manage to enjoy struggling through. The weekly puzzles this time around are much better. The vast, vast majority of them are well designed and fun, and they even have a bit more art. There's not as much as in the main game, but it was a noticeable improvement. They actually felt like a more worthy addition with effort put into their design rather than a tacked on side thing. And since I'm actually having fun with just the puzzles now, I enjoyed them. I still think they could use more context, but I'd rather have these puzzles with no context than not at all. Overall, I found Professor Layton in the Unwound Future to be an excellent experience. It does some things differently from Diabolical Box, but maintains the core gameplay loop and feeling that makes the Layton games so uniquely memorable, whimsical, and fun. For any step backwards in design, there were just as many steps forward in other areas. I loved it just as much as the gentlemanly duo's second adventure. I care about Layton both as a game series and a character even more than I did before, and considering the fact that I had a satisfied smile on my face for almost every moment of Diabolical Box, that is really saying something for me. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I do really need to replay Portal at some point to see what my favorite puzzle series is now. And finish Layton, of course, can't compare the incomplete things. Unwound Future was an excellent send-off to the first trilogy. And honestly, if the franchise had just ended here, it would have felt entirely fitting. But I'm very excited to look at all of the various Layton things eventually. For now, I'm going to go on to the first three Ace Attorney games, then there's a certain conceptually brilliant crossover to take a look at, and then I'm not sure if I'll enthusiastically dive into the rest of both franchises or take a bit of a break from them, but I do know that I'll cover everything Layton eventually. This has been Callus. Thanks so much for watching, and an especially large thank you to all of my patrons, like Lada, Edith, and Sam. I normally put a little aside as like a bit after my outro, but I decided to change things up this time. This is either going up near the end of 2020 or the start of 2021. 2020 was terrifying and horrible in so very many ways. And not to be a downer, but a switch doesn't just suddenly flip and make the world better because it's a new year. But we made it through 2020. Just surviving is an accomplishment in a normal year, and 2020 was far, far worse than a normal year. One day at a time, one step at a time, we made it. And I do really think that things will get better. Slowly, maybe, but they'll get there. We'll get there. Happy belated holidays, stay safe, and keep loving what you love. I'll see you next time with something else. I say, that was a close one. We gave them a taste of their own medicine. Funny, I don't remember you helping. Look, you're me, so that means I get some credit for assisting. Oh, is that so? That's very interesting logic. <laughs> <laughs>